Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology webinar. It's entitled, Patient-Derived Xenografts for Cancer Therapeutics Development and Predictive Modeling. One of the major obstacles to more rapid progress in oncology drug development has been the dearth of preclinical models that more reliably predict the clinical activity of new compounds in cancer patients. Now research are increasingly investigating the use of patient-derived tumor xenografts in immune-compromised rodents such as athymic mice, athymic nude, or skid mice for preclinical modeling. Today's webinar presenters are going to show you how the use of such tumor models is changing the face of cancer research. Let's meet our presenters. Dr. Walter Ausera is Senior Business Unit Manager, In Vivo Pharmacology Services at the Jackson Laboratory. During his presentation, Wally will further elaborate on the title of our webinar, Patient-Derived Xenografts for Cancer Therapeutics Development and Predictive Modeling. Dr. Philip Mack serves as Associate Adjunct Professor and Director of Molecular Pharmacology at the UC Davis Cancer Center. Phil is going to discuss the predictive utility of patient-derived xenografts specifically for lung cancer therapeutics. Dr. Chang Xian Pan is Associate Professor of Medicine and Urology and leader of the Urothelial Carcinoma Initiative at UC Davis. Chang will describe the use of patient-derived xenograft will describe the use of a patient-derived xenograft platform to guide precision medicine in bladder cancer. I'm John Sterling, editor in chief of Gen and I'm going to serve as moderator and try to stay out of the way of our excellent panel of presenters. After the panelists make their presentations, there will be a question and answer segment. Feel free to send in a question for our panelists at any time during the webinar. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible. So if everybody's ready, let's get going. Dr. Walter Alserer will be our lead-off presenter. Wally? Thanks, John. First, I'd like to thank the team at GEN for hosting this forum on what I think is, going to, is some really exciting work. Uh, for my part today, I'm just going to provide a brief introduction to the biology and the creation of PDX models and then pass things over to my colleagues at uh, UC Davis. This slide illustrates what we view as a central problem in the development of cancer therapeutics. And that is that only about 5% of drugs entering clinical trials actually makes it all the way to approval. Now, we believe a primary reason for this high failure rate is the inadequacy of the preclinical models typically used today. You know, in particular, the inability of these models to represent the structural and genetic diversity of human tumors. At the Jackson Laboratory, we've been working on the development of preclinical mouse models for decades now, and for about the last 10 years, one of our strong focus areas has been the development of PDX models that will have real predictive power for cancer therapeutics. If you don't know the Jackson Laboratory, uh, our headquarters is in Bar Harbor, Maine, where we have a large campus. About 10 years ago, we opened a secondary facility in Sacramento. This is a large mouse production facility where we do a lot of our PDX work, including our in vivo pharmacology testing. We have a CLIA laboratory there. Uh, we also have a new location, if you're not familiar with it, and that is the Jackson Laboratory Genomic Medicine Institute. This is located on the campus of the University of Connecticut Health Center. And this is a brand new facility just finishing up now that is really designed to keep JAKS at the forefront of human genetic research. Now let's shift our focus and talk about mouse xenograft models. What's shown here is the traditional nude mouse that many of us are familiar with. And on the left we see a nude mouse that's been implanted with MCF7 breast tumor cancer cells. And then on the right we see the same mouse after treatment when we see that the tumor has completely regressed. Now, there's a serious limitation with these mice, and that is the need to use established cell lines. These cell lines typically are homogeneous and therefore uh, don't do a good job at all at representing the heterogeneity, either structurally or genetically, of a real human tumor. Secondly, these mice are not immune deficient enough to typically support the uh, growth of either primary cells or patient tumor tissues. So it's really just uh, not the right model if you're doing PDX studies. Now at the Jackson Laboratories, we've focused on this problem for a number of years and have developed a very severely immune mouse called the NSG mouse, which is shown on the next slide. Now it's called NSG because their common name is a nod skid gamma mouse. 
And this is a highly immunodeficient model. It's deficient in T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. It has a long lifespan, typically more than 15 months, and it is a great host for the engraftment of primary cells or for fresh tumor tissue. And so all the work you'll hear today is based upon this model, the NSG mouse. Now, our program in PDX is really a clinician-driven program where we try to get fresh tissue direct from the operating room and into a first-generation mouse as quickly as possible, and sometimes we're able to do that in just a matter of hours. Now, once the tissue is engrafted into the P0 mouse, standing for passage 1, if we uh, can validate that the tumor does engraft and grow, we then take that tumor, a cryobank it, and this triggers a a variety of characterization tests. We do our our so-called omics testing, where we do gene expression analysis, copy number variation analysis, and also mutational analysis and and cryobank that. We'll then take that tumor, the cryobank tumor, and and expand it out in the so-called P1 cohort so we can create a a large um, library of frozen uh, tumor samples, and those are archived. Now, once you're ready to do a preclinical study, we take the archived tumor material, we expand it into what are called donor mice, and this is the P2 or passage 2 mice. Uh, we then grow it, take the P2 tumors, pass it them into the P3 uh, at, to create a large cohort big enough to support a preclinical study. So typically what we provide through the Jackson Laboratory are large cohorts of the passage three tumors. And our whole focus here is to try to get that tumor in enough mice at a very, very early early passage so that it retains uh, as much character of the original tumor as possible. I'll just show a couple slides here. My co-presenters will go more deeply into this. But the early passage PDX tumors really do retain a remarkable amount of the architecture or the structure of the tumor. This is just one example showing um, a triple negative breast cancer uh, cells in the patient sample, and then the same uh, uh, tumor in the first generation of PDX model showing sheets of large pleomorphic cells. And we typically see, again, um, remarkably good retention of structure of the tumor. We also see really impressive retention of gene expression profiles. What's shown here is comparison of the original patient tumor and a first-generation PDX, where the blue uh, uh, bars here represent the original tumor and the red represents the um, xenograft, and really good retention of gene expression profiles. Again, the whole key here is we try to get as early as possible, as close to the original tumor as possible. Using our program with our our clinical partners, we've created a large library of tumors, uh, over 300 uh, validated PDX tumor lines here. Uh, These are publicly available to any researcher in academia or industry. And you see we have a, a probably our biggest strength is in lung tumor lines, but we're also very strong in brain, colorectal, and, uh, and breast. So if you go to the Jackson website, we have in a complete listing of all the um, PDX tumors available uh, with all their characterization data. This is all freely available to anyone. There are several ways to access our PDX library. We do provide study-ready cohorts uh, of a size that you specify of uh, a whole variety of solid tumors, you know, breast, lung, bladder, colon, etc. We are also do quite a bit of work with uh, AML leukemia models. That's a really popular model for us. And sort of a sister uh, type of mouse here is something we call the humanized NSG mouse. This is not a PDX model, but it's the NSG mouse that's been engrafted with human immune system cells, uh, a really interesting model. The Jackson Lab can also perform preclinical drug efficacy testing at our CLIA lab in uh, Sacramento, if you care to have us do that. And lastly, we have a new pro- uh, program called PDX Live. Uh, traditionally, to run a PDX study, it takes months to bring the tumor out of the freezer and grow it up. And so what we've done is taken some of our most popular PDX models 
and have them growing today on the shelf. Things like our trip, some of our triple negative breast tumors, some of our popular uh, colon and lung tumor lines. And these are, you can basically just go on and order these and it really enables rapid studies uh, today, especially small pilot studies, it seems to be where it's catching on without waiting the three months or more for the tumors to grow up in mice. So these are all highly characterized and if you v- visit our website, uh, we have all the genetic and mutational information, et cetera, on those. So I'll pass the, uh, the baton over to Philip now. The, um, we have a very close partnership between the Jackson Laboratory and UC Davis. They were one of the founding members of our consortium, and we've worked together for, uh, for more than 10 years now, and uh, I think you'll find the work that's going on there really impressive and really important. So, John, over to you. Wally, thank you for that concise and informative overview of the power of patient-derived xenografts in advancing cancer research. That was a great job. Thank you very, very much. If you're just now joining our webinar, a big welcome. As I mentioned earlier, we will be conducting a Q&A segment following all the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Philip Mack, is ready to begin his presentation. Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. Glad to be here. In this portion of the webinar, I would like to discuss the advantages of the PDX system for advanced therapeutic modeling of lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most lethal malignancy in the world, accounting for nearly 1.6 million deaths every year. In the United States, an estimated 224,000 new cases will be diagnosed, and 160,000 patients will succumb to this disease. This slide shows the cancer mortality rate trends over the last century for men in the U.S. And you can see that lung cancer accounts for the plurality of deaths, peaking in the early 90s as cigarette usage begins to decline. A similar story is seen for women, with peak deaths just starting to trend down from a plateau shortly after the turn of the century. Now, clearly, tobacco smoke is the major cause of lung cancer. Here we see with the blue line in this graph uh, showing cigarette consumption mirrored a few decades later by the black line depicting lung cancer death rates. However, not all lung cancers are associated with tobacco. In fact, there is a troubling increase in the number and frequency of lung cancer deaths not associated at all with cigarette usage, particularly among younger women, where current estimates suggest that one in five new cases are not associated with smoking. Lung cancer in these never smokers rivals the mortality rates of ovarian and pancreatic cancer in women. Lung cancer is amongst the most genetically complex diseases, rivaled only by malignant melanoma. This graphic shows number of genetic mutations on a log scale in various cancer types with the major subhistologies of lung cancer, adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinoma indicated. To tackle this complexity, research has focused on identifying mutations that tumors are dependent on for their survival. These driver oncogenes have allowed us to begin to categorize lung cancers, not just by histology, but into theoretical treatment groups based on their genetics. Here we see the array of potential targetable mutations in adenocarcinomas as detected by the Lung Cancer Molecular Consortium. Currently, only two slices of this pie are treatable with FDA-approved drugs, those with EGFR mutations and ALK translocations, although therapies are in development for many of these other subpopulations. You can imagine the difficulty in developing and testing treatment strategies in such tiny, segmented populations. Worse still is that while EGFR and ALK-driven tumors are very responsive to their respective treatment strategies, emergence of resistance is essentially universal. Every patient will undergo it. So just focusing on that orange segment there, the EGFR, there are many different types of potential resistance mechanisms as shown here for EGFR disease, many of which remain completely unknown. We have treatment strategies for many of these newly acquired mutations that allow the tumors to become resistant to primary EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But if you think about it, now we are trying to develop therapies for very small fractions of a small fraction of the patients. So clearly, 
new research strategies are warranted if we are going to design and implement therapies tailored essentially to an individual tumor. This is why the UC Davis Cancer Center has teamed up with the Jackson Laboratories, the world's leading experts in mouse models, to develop a large and diverse series of patient-derived xenograft models of lung cancer origin. This slide shows the number of models currently available that have been fully characterized for their complement of driving mutations, global RNA expression, and gene copy number abnormalities. And every month, new models are added to the repertoire as they are developed, validated, and characterized. Our strategy for drug testing is shown in this slide. All therapeutics are conducted in early passage in treatment cohorts derived from a single donor mouse. To determine drug efficacy, mice are randomized to a treatment arm or control arm, and when the tumors reach a predetermined size, then precise tumor measurements are taken. But equally informative, a second independent study is conducted to assess the molecular effects of the agents. Do they inhibit their primary targets, such as EGFR? What are the effects of treatment on downstream signal transduction? What compensatory mechanisms or effects will the cell enact to attempt to reacquire homeostasis and overcome the effects of the drug? There is an exceptional degree of correlation in morphology between the patient tumor, labeled in the slide as PT, and the resultant PDX models, as Wally has described. For instance, in the top example, LG481, the glandular morphology of this adenocarcinoma observed in the patient tissue is retained during the first implantation in the mouse, the passage zero, and in subsequent passages, P1 and P2. Similarly, for squamous cell models, such as the LG0542 shown here, also have high histomorphic fidelity with the patient tissue. And also, as mentioned, driver mutations are conserved between the contributing patient tumor and the subsequent PDX model, with examples seen here including EML ALK fusions, KRAS, and EGFR activating mutations. Now, this slide shows the breakdown of the fully characterized adenocarcinoma models by their major mutation classes, mutant EGFR, mutant KRAS, an ALK translocated model, and a series of adenocarcinoma that do not harbor any of these three particular mutational dependencies, but certainly harbor their own complement of abnormalities, including, for instance, an NRAS driven model. The EGFR mutation positive models are shown here, four of which have gene amplification of EGFR to complement the mutation. Models to the left are derived from patients biopsied prior to any treatment whereas models to the right were established at the time of progression following a successful tumor control with erlotinib. And here we see the available PDX models that harbor KRAS mutations. A subset of these models, shown in the red circle, are amplified for KRAS. And MYC amplification, shown in the blue circle, is another common feature. The models in red are adenocarcinoma in origin, but as you can see, there's a squamous cell model, a large cell neuroendocrine model, and a matched pair of pleomorphic lines that are all KRAS mutant. And then this slide shows the squamous cell carcinoma models, and I organize them by their PI3 kinase status, with high expressors towards the top. A large number of these models have amplification of the PIK3CA gene indicated in the center circle which correlates very nicely with RNA expression levels. Several models indicated in the upper left harbor PI3 kinase or P10 mutations. And finally, several models have amplification of FGF receptor 1, which is another potentially targetable oncogene in squamous cell carcinoma. And that is shown in the green circle towards the right. And you can see the overlap in several models between PI3 kinase and FGF receptor 1 amplification, which we believe will have significant therapeutic implications. Now, one of the main advantages of the PDX model system and the collaboration with the UC Davis Cancer Center is the ability to compare activity of the PDX model to the treatment experiences of the contributing patient. Now, I designed this graphic to show the relationship between the development of the PDX model along with the patient's disease course. So as you follow along the diagram, which estimates tumor burden, you can see that this patient received the EGFR inhibitor or lotinib and had a great durable response. At the time of progression, at relapse, a new biopsy was acquired and a PDX model was implanted and grown. 
Now, importantly, the patient went on to receive a promising new treatment regimen composed of two drugs named afatinib and cetuximab. Those are both EGFR inhibitors. You can see them in the green box towards the bottom right. The patient responded very well to this combination before finally progressing. So we treated the PDX model derived from this patient with the same agents that the patient received. One of the advantages, of course, uh, is that the PDX models can we can test multiple regimens in statistically significant cohorts simultaneously. So here we treated with the same uh, effective combination of afatinib and cetuximab that the patient received, and that's the yellow growth curve at the very bottom. And like the patient, as you can see, the PDX model showed a great response to this therapy. But also look at the effects of the single agents. Surprisingly, the cetuximab monotherapy proved to be just as effective in the mouse model. That's the green line. To try and understand this effect and to help us identify other patients that may benefit similarly, we conducted a lot of molecular analysis to gauge the effects of these treatments on receptor activity and signal tr transduction. And some of this work is displayed here on this complicated slide. To summarize all of these data graphically, here we see at baseline, prior to any treatment, this tumor has really high activity of EGFR signaling, which engages the ERK pathway, the P38 pathway, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, and mTOR signaling. However, upon treatment with the effective drugs, EGFR phosphorylation is almost completely ablated resulting in parallel downregulation of all signal pathways simultaneously with no evidence of compensatory upregulation of survival factors. And this is in contrast to models where the drugs are less active, where the primary target EGFR is not fully inhibited, uh, or survival pathways such as uh, P38 uh, kick in and rescue the cell. The PDX model system gives us an opportunity to not just test the new therapeutic strategies, but analyze the effects in detail at a molecular level, and then we can go back and refine and improve those treatment strategies. So in summary, our experience with the PDX system is that the models recapitulate the clinical activity observed in the contributing patients. We are also able to deconstruct the contributions of individual drugs within a drug regimen and provide a lot of insight into the molecular effects of these drugs, which can allow us to design better strategies. We fully expect that the PDX models will allow us to identify specific molecular barriers and impediments to successful drug outcomes, allow us to refine and improve our treatment strategies, and essentially serve as an incubator for clinical trial concepts that can be immediately brought to our patients. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, John. And Phil, thank you very, very much for that very detailed presentation on the predictive utility of patient-derived xenografts for lung cancer therapeutics. I don't think there's any doubt that they definitely constitute a promising modality for getting a better handle on the treatment of lung cancer, so thank you very much. Before our third presenter takes the stage, I want to remind everyone of our Q&A segment that follows his talk. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our third panelist, Dr. Chang Xian Pan, is ready to begin his presentation. Chang? Thank you, John. So today I'm going to talk about the PD, using a PDX platform to guide precision medicine in blood cancer. When people talk about blood cancer, people usually think blood cancer is only one group of, of disease. In fact, blood cancer includes two distinct groups of disease. The first group we call non-invasive blood cancer. And this group of patients account for 75 to 80 percent of all patients. Even though this group of patients they have a high recurrence rate, this group of patients do not die from blood cancer. There's another group of patients we call locally advanced or metastatic blood cancer. This group of patients account for only 20 to 25 percent of patients, but this group of patients will die from disease disease. And chemotherapy usually is an integrated part of treatment. However, the chemotherapy medication we use today is still the same medication we used three decades ago. And there's no change of overall survival over the last 30 years. And not like lung cancer, 
kidney cancer, prostate cancer, there's no target therapy for bladder cancer. There's no new medication for bladder cancer for the last 15 years. So today I'm going to talk about using a PDX platform to guide the precision medicine in bladder cancer with a long-term goal is to reduce the bladder cancer mortality. When we talk about precision medicine, usually we mean using state-of-the-art technologies to identify the molecular changes of a disease. In this case, it's bladder cancer. Then we design an individualized treatment to targeting these molecular changes in the cancer. So currently we use genomics, proteomics, glycomics, and metabolomics to identify the changes in, in the cancer. Because all of these technologies generate a huge amount of information. Therefore, we usually use computational biology to identify these genetic changes. And based on these genetic changes, we are going to design individualized treatment. Even though the principle of precision medicine is very straightforward, however, in clinic, it is not very effective. So far, there are two clinical trials have been published. The first clinical trial was published in clinical cancer research in 2012. This is a phase one clinical trial performed by the MD Anderson Cancer Center. In this clinical trial, they observed a response rate of only 27% for the mesh treatment targeting some molecular changes of the cancer. Another clinical trial was published at the Lancet Oncology about three months ago. And this clinical trial focused on metastatic breast cancer, and they found the response rate is only 9%. So why the precision medicine does not work as it is supposed to work? One major reason is that each cancer has many genetic changes. As Dr. Phil Mack mentioned, in lung cancer, there are hundreds of genetic changes. Only a few of these genetic changes are called driver mutations that are critical for, for, critical for cancer cell functions. And only when the medication targeting these driver mutations, the medication can kill the cancer cells. For all the other changes, we call it passenger changes. Even we give medication targeting the other changes, the medication will not work. However, currently the computational biology cannot tell which one is the driver mutation, which one is the passenger mutations. So in our project, we are going to use a PDX to guide the precision medicine in breast cancer. So we use the same state-of-the-art technology to identify genetic changes in the cancer at this stage, we are going to use a PDX. And at first, we can use a PDX to screen for the most effective medications. As you know, the cancer patients have very limited lifespan, and at each time, we can only use one or two or a few medications. But in PDX, we can generate huge amount of PDX, and we can screen many medications at the same time. We can also study the mechanism of resistance in the human patients, we can only do biopsy once or a few times for each patient. But with PDX, we can do biopsy many times and to study how the genetic changes occurred during the treatment. By this way, we can study the mechanism of resistance. We can also use a PDX to screen for the most effective chemotherapy medications. Currently, there are several medications used in breast cancer and each medication has a response rate only 15 to 30%. But with PDX, we can screen for the most effective medications and use for the patients. And we can also use this PDX to design the combination of chemotherapy and target therapy to optimize the dose and the schedules. And based on the information of this PDX, we can design a precision medicine for each specific patient. And we can also use this information for drug development and to guide the clinical trial. And this is a flow uh, chart of how we do this PDX to guide the precision medicine. So first, we have patient specimen. We send the Jackson West to establish the PDX. Then we do a deep sequencing, use a computational biology to identify genetic changes in the cancer. Then we combine the tissue microarray with immunohistochemical staining, immunofluorescence staining, western blot, or direct sequencing to confirm the genetic changes. And we do a screening test to look for the most effective medication in the mice. 
then we use this information to guide precision medicine in breast cancer, cancer patients. So far, we have 15 breast cancer PDS deficit should the engraftment rate is 41%. So the first we look at morphology to see, make sure the morphology is maintained. So in the left side, we have a subcutaneous xenograph. PT means the patient's breast cancer spe specimen. P0 means the first xenograph established in the mice. And P1 and P2 means the passage 1 and passage 2. And you can see in this PDX, the morphology of the breast cancer cells are maintained. On the right side, we also established an orthotopic breast cancer model. On the right uh, up panel, it shows a whole breast cancer specimen. The black arrowhead point to the normal urosynthesis of the breast, and the red star point to the breast cancer xenograph PDX. And the low panel of the right side shows a high magnification of the breast cancer cells, and you can see the morphology is maintained. And next, we use this PDX model, uh, model to determine the efficacy of the nanoparticle we develop in our lab. So in our lab, we develop a breast cancer-specific ligand we call PLC4. Uh, on the left up corner, shows the structure of a nanoparticle. So inside the nanoparticle, we can load either drug or dye for imaging. And on the surface of this nanoparticle, we conjugate this PLC4 for cancer-specific targeting. And the size of this nanoparticle is about 24 to 25 nanometers. So at first, we determine the cancer-specific drug delivery. So, uh, at the right side of the slide, you can see we use three cell kind of cells. The first is a human breast cancer cell line called 5637 cells. And the second one, we use a dog breast cancer cell line, TCCPUIN. And we also use a dog normal urosin cells. On, on the up panels, we incubate these cell lines with nanoparticle with PLC4 on the surface. On the low panels, we incubate these cell lines with nanoparticle without PLC4, and you can see there's a huge difference of drug delivery. On the right side, you can see the normal urosin cells, whether they are incubated with PLC4 nanoparticle or just nanoparticle. There's no nanoparticle inside normal cells. Also okay, next, we determine the in vivo drug delivery. So in this study, in the same mice, at the left side, we inject a lung cancer cell line, H23, 2A, and our PLC4 does not bind these lung cancer cells. And on the right side, we have a patient-derived xenograph. Then we inject this PLC4 nanoparticle through the tail vein to see where does this nanoparticle go. And at the right side, at the left panel, low panel, you can see the white uh, means the high nanoparticle goes to breast cancer cells, uh, PDX xenograph, but very little goes to lung cancer xenograph. Uh, as a right, you can see we cut this xenograph in half, and if there's any nanoparticle, you can see the red fluorescence. So DAPI is standing for nucleus. You can see both lung cancer and breast cancer. There are a lot of cancer cells, but you can only see the red fluorescence means that the nanoparticle only goes to breast cancer cells, but does not go to lung cancer xenograph. And the next, uh, we do, did an efficacy study. I'm sorry if the slides did not show very well. So in this study, we compare the free paxitaxel, means that uh, it is a standard second-line chemotherapy for breast cancer, at 10 milligrams per kg, and the medium survival only about 20 to 25 days. When we, we formulate this paxitaxel in this PLC4 nanoparticle, we can significantly decrease the toxicity, and we can give up to three times the nanoparticle dose without increasing the toxicity. And we can increase the medium survival in this PDX mice from 25 days to 76 days. And the low panel, you can see that paxitaxel is a microtubular inhibitor. It can inhibit cell cycle uh, G2 M phase, and you can see there's a dose-dependent cell cycle arrest. When the PDX mice treated with uh, paxitaxel at 30 mg, you can see a lot of cells are arrested at G2 M phase. And for the first ad PDX, we have performed the whole exome sequencing, microRNA sequencing, and transcriptome sequence. And we have also identified many genetic changes. 
of this first at PDX. Uh, this slide just shows you a summary of our study of this first at PDX. First look at PDX number one is the second column from the left. This PDX is the HO2 positive and SARC positive. However, the HO2 inhibitor lapatinib and SARC inhibitor ponatinib both are not effective at all. So this is consistent with the clinical trial I mentioned before. For most mm, target therapy in uh, target therapy is not effective. Then we also look at the second PDX, this is a third column from the left. This PDX is FGFR, means fibroblast growth factor receptor R positive, as well as FB4 positive. BGJ398 is, is FGFR3 inhibitors. It can effectively decrease the tumor growth and prolong the overall survival. The same with FB4, which can also significantly prolong the overall survival with a p-value of 10 to the minus 6. Then we also look at PDX number 7. There's a second column from, from the right. And this PDX is HO2, HO3 positive. And lipatinib is a HO1, HO2 inhibitor. But HO3 can need to dimerize with HO1, uh, EGFR, and HO2. And you can see lipatinib can significantly prolong the overall survival. The same with FGFR3. The BGG398 is a FGFR3 inhibitor and it can also prolong the overall survival. And we have another patient which is not listed here. That patient is FB4 positive, and we found that FB4 inhibitor is effective. So at this time, this patient is entering a clinical trial based on this study in PDX. So here, just just summary what I have talked. So far, we in collaboration with Jackson West, we have established a blood cancer xenograph model so far, we have 15 breast cancer PDX. For the first eight, we have performed the whole exome sequencing, RNA-seq and macro-RNA-seq. And we have also identified many genetic mutations, overexpressions, and confirmed this target selection based on the IHC staining, immunofluorescence staining. We have performed the FQC study in several of these PDX, and one of these patients has already gone into a clinical trial. And I think I'll stop here and I'll go back to John. Well, thank you, Chang, and thank you again, Wally and Phil, for providing such detailed presentations on patient-derived xenografts for cancer research. This is really an exciting field, and uh, gentlemen have done a wonderful job uh, on these presentations. Thank you. And you're all able to shed lots of light on the potential of this approach, so I am sure that our webinar visitors uh, are intrigued by all of this. We're almost ready to begin our Q&A session, but first I'd like to ask you to disable your pop-up blockers because a short survey on this webinar is going to be appearing in a moment. We would very much appreciate your feedback on this webinar. We have a number of very interesting questions, so why don't we get going and take the first one. Wally, we have a first question for you. And uh, I think what he means here, how many, how many mice are injected with tumors? That's the way I'm reading that. And any resource for handling the tumors before inoculation? Uh, well, let me answer uh, with our standard workflow. Typically, we would inoculate uh, five uh, mice at the P0 stage. And then in order to graduate to the next stage, we would grow those tumors typically to about 1,000 millimeters cubed. And then depending on, uh, on how many of those um, you know, graduate the program, then uh, we would uh, typically do characterization on all that graduate that program and then pass those along to the next generation. I, th I think that answers it, John. Okay, I think you did. And another question, Wally. Do you have orthotopic models of lung PDX tumors? And do you use orthotopic PDX tumor models for other types of cancer? Uh, almost all the work we do today, John, is subcutaneous. So we typically do not uh, do work today in the orthotopic model. Okay, and another question. Do you do in vitro subcultures of the P, looks like PO tumors or directly inoculate to the P1, et cetera, et cetera? 
Yeah, everything we do is direct inoculate, direct inoculation. So we don't do any uh, any culturing. Thank you very much. Okay, Phil, we have a few questions for you. Do most tumor types grow successfully in this PDX model? The answer to that is highly variable. So the ability of tumors to implant and grow in the PDX uh, is dependent on the tumor type, the stage, the grade of the tumor. Some tumors, such as pancreatic cancer, take very well, whereas others, such as prostate cancer, are difficult to establish. So in lung cancer, we found that the take rate is dependent essentially on how aggressive the tumor is. So a small stage 1A surgical tumor have very low take rates, about 10%, although it does appear that there's a correlation between those patients with tumor recurrence after surgery and the ability to take as a PDX, which is highly interesting. In advanced stage, i.e. metastatic lung tumor, they take very well, but it's also dependent on how indolent the tumors are in the patients. So a relatively slower growing EGFR mutation or an ALK mutant tumor has a lower take rate compared to a very aggressive KRAS mutant tumor or squamous cell carcinoma, where the take rates can easily exceed 75%. Thank you very much. And Phil, let's see this question. Do you have matching blood cells DNA from the patients? Uh, these aren't routinely collected uh, by the Jackson Laboratory. However, uh, for the patients that were established, or the PDXs that were established from UC Davis patients, we actually do have banked uh, uh, blood and DNA cells from these, from every single one. Okay. And let's see. Why are only the early pass? Let me read this right. Why? Are the early passages the only ones that are valuable? Is it because of genetic evolution concerns? Uh, essentially, yes. So the goal of the PDX program is to uh, establish a model that recapitulates or reflects the human tumor cell situation in the patients. So the further it gets passage along, the more likely it's going to drift or acquire, you know, new mutations that may cause it to grow uh, faster or differently. So we, we don't want it to go through the same situations that cell lines do in cell culture, uh, where they've been passaged thousands of times and they've really selected out the most uh, ag aggressive clones. We want it to be as close as possible to the human patient tumor. So we want, our aim is to treat in the lowest passage possible. Thank you for that. And here's a straightforward question. Is the PDX model covered by medical insurance? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Uh, not yet, anyway, I should say. Uh, perhaps in the future, uh, this might be the case. Uh, but basically, it's going to have to go through a round of demonstration in a clinical trial to show that uh, there's benefit to the PDX, of the PDX model system to the patient. Uh, and before that happens, I don't think that uh, insurers in this country are going to pay for it. Okay, thank you. And uh, Phil, let's see here. In your NSG model, can its environmental selection pressure cause specific biological or genetic selection in the PDX establishment, I guess, of the PDX model? Uh, the answer to this is probably yes. Uh, I'm going to interpret this to mean that uh, the questionnaire is asking about the difference in the uh, tumor microenvironment in the mouse compared to that of the original host tumor. And there are certainly differences because a number of the growth factors and ligands that uh, the tumors are used to being in the presence of, especially a lot of interleukins, uh, uh, are going to be very different in the mice. Not all of a mouse growth factors are cognate with the human receptors. A, a key example here, particularly in lung cancer, is uh, the MET receptor, the ligand HGF in the mouse, uh, is not cognate for the human. So if the tumor is used to being in an environment of, with human HGF present, uh, it's not going to be in the same environment. Now, we're aware of this, and we've actually taken measures to address this particular instance. But yes, there's going to be some evolution that we cannot avoid because of the difference in the mouse microenvironment compared to the human. Great. Chang, we did forget about you. Uh, are your PDX models prepared as orthotopic models or as sub-Q models? So as Wally said, usually for FP0, we inject the subcutaneous area because this is easier to monitor. And once I form the P0 xenograph, 
we can inject the auth topic, topic area to form auth topic model. Okay, thank you very much. And let's see another question for you, Chong. How many times can the tumor be passaged through mice before they lose their molecular properties? Okay, so in the blood cancer PDX xenograph, we found the two mutations in the PRK3. One of the PDX is D549Y mutations, and at the passage two, we can we use the direct sequencing, and uh, about 50% of the PDX cells have these mutations, but at the passage six, there's none. And there's another passage in PDX we found H1047R mutations. In that one from passage zero to passage two to passage six, about 80% of the cancer cells have these mutations. So it's very stable. And Chang, can you comment on the cancer stem cells, especially in any case where the cancerous graft appearing, appears to grow even after treatment? Would they have any similar architecture in both patient and animal pet? Patient or patent, I'm not sure, in animal models. So uh, in several of these bladder cancer PDX, we treat this bladder cancer PDX with chemo chemotherapy. And after chemotherapy, the tumor shrink. And then we check the population and cell surface markers for bladder cancer stem cells. And after chemotherapy, the percentage of cancer stem cell increase. But when the tumor cells grow again and the PDX increase in size, we found the PDX, the cancer stem cell uh, proportion decrease. And we also look at the architecture morphology of the blood cancer cells. And from passage two to passage six, before and after chemotherapy, the morphology are maintained. Thank you, John. Wally, got some more questions for you. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation, excellent presentation indeed. I was wondering if there are any PDX prostate cancer models in humanized NSG mice. Uh, we do have two uh, validated models. Both of those, as I recall, are relatively slow gr growing, but we do have, um, yeah, the information on that at the Jackson website. So at least two models. And Wally... This year, how much time does it take to reach 1,000 mm4? You know, highly variable. Um, I would say sort of the average would be three months. But uh, sort of as Philip was mentioning, it really depends on the, you know, the growth characters, uh, characteristics of the tumor. Um, you know, like I said, prostate can grow much slower. Some uh, more aggressive tumors much more rapidly. But you pretty much looking at three months. Can I make some comments? Sure. Usually for a passage zero, as Wally said, it takes about three to four months. But once the form PDX is established, it will take a very short time for a passage two to passage six, maybe only 20 days or 30 days. Thank you, Chang. And Phil, this question just came in for you. Uh, do you have PDX tumors that are known to be drug resistant? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, although I am more focused on lung cancer, this is true also in breast cancer. We have established models from uh, patients at the time of progression on therapy. Uh, and in our early experimentation, uh, there seems to be a good correlation, as I pointed out in my presentation, between uh, the PDX response and the patient response. So we have established PDX tumors from patients at the time that they should be uh, resistant to particular drug therapies, and they appear to maintain that for the most part. Thank you very much. And Phil, another question. What do you have PDX? Hold on. Oh, here we go. What is the percentage of engraftment? Could you explain a little bit how you how do you prepare matrigel crude the tumor sample for transplantation? Uh, Sure, uh, although Wally can uh, put in as well. Uh, the basic strategy, at least uh, at the Jackson Laboratories, is to implant the tumor as just a fragment with no processing, no major gel. So it's implanted into the mouth subcutaneously with the entire human microenvironment intact, and that seems to promote growth. 
Thank you. And Wally, back to you, a question. Uh, is there a minimum or maximum amount of, amount of tissue that you implant into the PO mouse? Yeah, our target is a three cubic millimeter fragment. So, um, I mean, that, that's what we shoot for. We typically have that much, and so I, I can't really comment on, on much less than that, but, but that's what our protocol calls for. And I can add to that, uh, if you don't mind, this is Phil. Uh, so the amount of tumor tissue available is also dependent on what is uh, acquired from the patient. So we've established models from very large uh, tumor surgical pieces uh, where you can cut it up into a number of fragments and implant five or ten uh, mice. But we've also established them from very small uh, core needle biopsies uh, where really you only have one shot at it. Uh, and so uh, that's a very small amount of tumor implanted into a single mouse. Uh, however, if the tumor is aggressive enough in the patient, it will grow. Okay, thank you. And Wally, do you transplant single cells or pieces of tumor? Uh, it's always a piece of tumor. So we don't do any disaggregation. Uh, we, we go straight from small fragments directly into the mouse. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time for the webinar. But please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends, which we highly recommend. I want to say thanks again to the panel for the outstanding presentations, and a big thank you to the audience for your attention and for your very thoughtful questions about different topics brought up during the webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Jackson Laboratory, whose support made this webinar possible. Bye for now.